So let's continue with <coughs> with Weber. Um, this slide is just uh, elaborating or spelling out what I'm going to say with about this one. Uh, so to recapitulate this slide, you should just go to the previous one when you read when you read for yourself. The thing here is that <coughs> um, we have discussed this map and the conditions for how a company can choose to to relocate or to decide to to locate elsewhere and whether that and also that the decision can be affected by new transport infrastructure which could make new locations more uh, more favorable but as a part of this uh, this uh, let's say th this decision you could also have the dynamics <coughs> connected to the choice of a new <coughs> sorry new suppliers and or new markets so <coughs> we can consider a movement from, uh, for instance, uh, K <coughs> to, to F for the for the for this manufacturer, which uh, makes it possible to for F to consider using other suppliers or even serve other markets in the area. Location G is also an alternative here, given that uh, the cost differences can be obtained, which can make the, uh, the location in G able to use M2, a combination of M2 and M4. It is obviously more profitable to be here than here for the company. So <coughs> In real life contexts, you consider to move to another location perhaps because of uh, too high transport costs or too high labor costs or whatever. And you try to work out <coughs> what is the, how is the industry structure looking in the area, wh where are the suppliers located, how is the transport uh, system designed. And you may end up in a location like this using these two suppliers and serving a market up here. And you have then been through the assessment of this location, this location, and perhaps other locations, and you end up here as the most most uh, profitable place to, to, to locate in. So uh, <coughs> I'm not saying that companies are, let's say, moving around constantly to, to look for new locations, but this is a part of an assessment process. Yes? Yes, they can. They can, <coughs> they can, uh, well, this, this depends, of course, upon The simplest Weberian uh, framework assumes also that the customers are evenly distributed across space. Uh, that is normally not the case. So we would consider, of course, also the size of the market for the end users. And if the size of the market is biggest here, you could have a location with these two suppliers and then a, a, a market in the, in the urban core if that is, uh, if that is the, the most profitable solution for the, for the company. Because this is a, as I said, this should be considered as a geographic space and uh, where, of course, Customers can be clustered in sp in specific regions, regions here, but the Weberian framework at the outset assumes then that they are e evenly distributed across across.
across space. But that doesn't actually matter too much uh, when, we, when we apply this concept because we simply address where our customers located, where are their supplies located, and the, and the transport costs and labor costs and land use costs and everything goes in with it. Yep. Yeah, if the if the if the prices includes, uh, let's say, entry costs in the market, yes, um, they can include entry costs. They can include relocation costs. You could also include uncertainty as to whether you are in fact able to to penetrate a new market. Uh, if this is uh, not the city of Oslo, but it may be uh, in um, a global decision problem, there are lo lot lots of risks involved, which can uh, can uh, can affect this. So it's possible to expand, but if you're going to translate this into a, let's say a rich linear programming uh, problem, which is let's say. You can solve this by means of a linear programming pr problem, and then if there are too many interdependencies, it soon becomes quite messy. But it can be included, at least conceptually. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> you can also extend this to a large number of suppliers, uh, and so on. But. Uh, In real world, in in real world cases, things becomes, of course, complex as we have discussed now with the uh, differences in land use costs, labor costs. Uh, there may be interdependencies and and uh, and so on. But if you think about it, and if you let's say study location behavior for companies. And even for for people, it's uh, it's easy to let's say discover that this is uh, this concept is actually applied in uh, in practice, and it's based on uh, on uh, traditional microeconomic theory on cost minimization and utility maximization with the limitations that goes with many of the assumptions, of course. Some of them, as I said, can be, can be uh, released and we can modify. Uh, others are more tricky to, uh, to, to modify because there are interdependencies between the variables. <coughs> To sum up uh, a bit, um, in this simplest, f in its simplest form, we can we can talk about two cases: uh, the weight losing case. That means that the product that this manufacturer produces is uh, loses weight. So, the, so the, 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 end, the product that is shipped to the market weighs less than the sum of the weights for the production factors. And this is the, the, the case with the steel production, which uses a lot of uh, ore, rocks, where you uh, where you extract, uh, which you extract uh, the iron from, and then you make steel by means of of iron, and and, and uh, where you add carbon through a heating process. But the ore is the is the real, let's say, heavy substance here, weighs a lot. So the transport costs will be lower 
per kilometer from the production facility and to the end the market than from the source and to the processing location. Let's say the transport cost per unit of of the final product per ton per t sorry per ton steel transported to the market you need a lot of rocks to extract the steel so the transport cost per ton of the finished good is higher at this side because you need so much of the of the supplies so <coughs> and then you can see well what if we locate closer to the to the source, to the mine, we see that uh, uh, production costs are, no, sorry, the transport costs are uh, smaller, and we we substitute the, the very expensive transport with less expensive transport to the end user market, and the the optimal location will be close to the source of the materials in this case, which is exactly the difference between the US and the Soviet Union way of planning these, these uh, processing plants for steel then. The US were located here, as, as we can see from, which will be a good, good location based on the, on the Weberian reasoning, whereas the Soviet Union plants could be here or even quite close to the market, so with very high transport cost as, <coughs> as, the, as the consequence. The opposite case <coughs> is the weight gaining case where reproduction adds weight to or transport costs, if you like, to the end, to the final product. And it's exactly the same logic. It's uh, it's better to to process close to the market to save transport costs. It could be costs. It could be weight. It could be uh, it could be um, the lifespan of the pro uh, product. You can tra translate this reasoning into the many, many aspects. Let's say if, if you combine or you produce by using supplies that are uh, durable, they can stand quite a lot of uh, transport time and distance without being destroyed, whereas the final product could be perishable, meaning that uh, it could easily be, be destroyed if the transport distance is long, and hence you could be better off locating close to the market to avoid that risk. So there are many, many specific cases that can be actually assessed by this simple framework. So that is the weight gaining case or if the end user product is more perishable than the supplying factors or the production factors. This is a very nice example of a weight gaining case, which I came across when I visited Svalbard a couple of years ago. Uh, this is an island up north, way up north. From from Norway, uh, and um, it has a tradition for being. Uh, it's a it's a mining industry up there, extracting coal, coal from the from the mountains around here. And the main <coughs> the main city. There are two, three bigger or bigger. They are not big, but three what you can call cities: Longyearbyen, Nyolsund, and. Uh, Barentsburg. This is Longyearbyen, which is the biggest one. They have an airport. They have a fairly developed road system. Ice beers. 
and uh, everything. But they have, have, a, have a number of mines around this city. There's one here, there's one here, one here, and a series or a number of mines in this direction. And I extracted coal, and I transported the coal by means of, uh, of uh, cable ways from these locations and into Longyearbyen, where there was a, a hub, which is still there, um, that uh, received all the coal and then shipped it a hundred meters or so down to the port. So it looked like this. This is, uh, this is Longyearbyen down here. And this is one of the cableways leading the, the coal from mine one. It's a cable and small wagons that used to take the coal down, down to here, approximately here. And this hub looks like this. The cables are, uh, are gone because this is not used anymore, but the cables came in here, 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 and uh, back here. And it was dropped simply right down here, and the port is below. So they took this coal in. And the weight gaining here is that the final product here is the merge of all the, all the flows that came in right down to the, to, to the ship, and then they shipped it out to the market, which I tried to illustrate here. So this arrow is, is the shipment out to the market. And the Germ there were a German engineer who was responsible for this, uh, this uh, arrangement. So I think it was uh, established in the early 20s, 1920s. And I feel pretty sure that they, <coughs> they, they didn't perhaps know too much about Weber, even if they could, since it was invented in 1909. But the thinking is perfect. It's a perfect application of this Weberian way of thinking. This is a preserved installation. You are not allowed to, to move it or destroy it or tear it down or anything. It's a nice piece of, of engineering work, actually. Then on to another location theory, which is also relevant for, uh, for uh, urban areas. And uh, through Hotling's work in the 1930s, we <laughs> got an introduction of uh, spatial competition, where companies use location as a competitive factor. That is something new as compared to, to Weber. For Weber, he assumed perfect competition, no price changes, nothing. Whereas this theory introduces uh, spatial monopolies and, uh, and spatial competition. I'll see how, it, how this works. So uh, Hoteling, he talks about a long, narrow city. That is his uh, shorthand description of his market. Along a line. O, zero to L, the market has a uniform distribution over the distance. I, I often I think about when I come from the other side of this fjord uh, in the evening and I look at this city, Molde, it's a very long, narrow city. It, uh, it doesn't have this, this assumption fulfilled that it is a uniform distribution over the distance because most people live in the in the in the core of the city, but it uh, it works um, in a way that we start by considering a market with a uniform distribution over a 
certain distance. The consumers will prefer the lower pr lowest price, which is in accordance with the uh, with the microeconomic theory. And the transport costs are constant per ton kilometer, which we uh, recognize from the from this uh, Weberian location theory. We can modify the last point to also encompass uh, uncertainty and congestion here as well as we could in the in the Weberian case. If we start with the simplest uh, solution here, we have two companies, equal transport costs, which are measured through the slope of these curves. So if we have distance in the horizontal dimension and costs in the vertical dimension, the slope of these lines gives you the cost per distance unit, which could be transport costs per kilometer. And in this case, <coughs> it's uh, equal transport costs for each of the companies A and B, and the costs are equal in each direction. This is a a two-dimensional space, because the slopes are equal. The difference is in the production costs. And this is these are production costs by units given by the by the length of this uh, this stem here. So in this case for firm A the trans the production costs are like this and for the for the other company their production costs like this. So even if the one <coughs> company B has more expensive products sold at the factory's door, so to speak, they will still have an advantage in terms of space because to the right of this point, company B has the lowest costs of the product delivered at the customer's house. And my, my firm A has the advantages to the left of this line. So we see that even if production costs are uh, different, and uh, in one case the production costs are higher than, they have a kind of protection in terms of distance to the other company, A. So, um, and that is <coughs> what I talked about on an earlier lecture. These lines are sort of affected when we do something with the transport infrastructure. When we do something with the uh, transport infrastructure, we can reduce or shift the slope of the, the, the um, transport costs downwards. And then <coughs> the game may, might might change radically. We can have a look at this one. <coughs> um, for various reasons, the transport costs are different for these two companies. Uh, this one has uh, high production costs and low transport costs. And this one has quite low production costs, but very high transport costs. So this is the situation at the outset. And they divide the market between them like this, because of the, the total costs as the sum of the production costs and the transport costs. But then we can imagine 
a situation where what will happen here if company A gets the same transport costs as company B in terms of uh, costs per kilometer. Then in this case, the slope will be like this. And we can easily see that B, company B, will be wiped out of the market. They will not be able to compete unless they reduce their production costs. We can see here a situation where we have this, we can consider this as perhaps a, a large producer with low unit costs because they, are, they have a big production capacity and uh, lots of scale effects from that. Transport costs are quite low. This is the, a small local producer with high production costs and these are comparable pro products. But, and, and they have even high transport costs, this company B. But there are still a small fraction of the market left for company B. So this may be the local shop or a local producer serving a very, very local market. But because it's, uh, it's quite far from their local customers to to drive to here to get their groceries or, or whatever, they are still in business. But you can easily see that if, if the transport costs, let's say you have a, a, a road, road improvement, problems may occur, even if the road improvement will also benefit this company they may be run out of business simply because of the differences in, in production costs. And this is, this is kind of the story about the local shop being, uh, being run out of business because of, uh, of uh, transport system improvements and, uh, and transport costs. So uh, <coughs> in the Norwegian countryside, it used to be a lot of small local shops around. Most of them are gone, are gone way for say 20, 10 to 20 years ago, 40, 30, 40 years ago. They started to disappear. There are not many of them left. It has to do with the improved quality of the transport infrastructure. It has to also to do with increasing car ownership and so on, mobility in general. But it works quite well to sort of understand some of the some of the um, structural changes that has, has taken place in uh, in many in many countries, in many regions during let's say the recent decades. So, <coughs> of course, for this local producer, it could be a way to try to cut back on the, or to reduce the, the production costs. But in many, many cases, that is not easy because the difference in production costs is simply caused by scale effects. They are small, unit costs are high, and they cannot cope with the competition from, from the uh, low cost producer A if, uh, if the transport costs are reduced. So location may give companies monopoly power in local markets. That is, uh, that is one main, main conclusion here. Um, and uh, if the distances between companies are large, production cost changes means less, and the transport costs more to whether local mon monopoly can be maintained or not. So this is, let's say, the, the more static version of 
Hotelings location theory. It is about distances, production costs, to explain why you can have uh, smaller local markets with high cost, uh, high cost producers. Then we can consider a situation where two producers engage in a kind of a competition. They're using location as a means for gaining market power. And uh, Hoteling, in his original article, used two ice cream sellers at the beach to illustrate his, uh, his points. Uh, and he, he showed why, how the location behavior among those two competitors would result in a, in a, in a, in a specific uh, location pattern. Um, <coughs> it's important in cases where the competition is on product characteristics more than price. Uh, they tend to locate close to each other and they use do that because of the scale effects connected to a common pool of customers. Come back to that later on. But you can um, if you if you if you travel around a bit in cities in many parts of the world you can see, you can observe that the retail shops for uh, shoes are located close to each other. In Oslo, you find a, st a street where the shoe shops are located. In, in, in Salt Lake City, in the US, in Utah, where I was a uh, couple of, some years back, all the car retailers were located in the same street, close to each other. And the reason for that <coughs> is that the products that are offered to the market is different. They are not competing for the same exactly the same product. There are variants of the product. And the customers are not homogeneous in the sense that they prefer exactly the same type of shoes or the exactly the same brand of cars. But the, but, but the probability that one customer could actually purchase one of, let's say, my company's products is larger if we have this common pool of customers because there are some uncertainty involved as to whether they have very clear preferences for for a given car brand or a given shoe brand or a given brand of clothing for that sake but when it comes to homogeneous goods like petrol diesel things like that, which doesn't have any kind of difference, actually, at least not on at the outset. You never find a row or a, or a bunch of petrol stations located closely together. You find perhaps a couple, but not many. Because <coughs> the story there is that the production of such goods could have a, um, will have scale char characteristics. So when the demand increases, the unit costs decreases. And we, if one of those players gets a slight competitive advantage over the other, th there it tends to be a self-reinforcing process where one of the petrol stations will be in the market. And often you can see that in, in, uh, in some areas where they, uh, when they engage into, into price wars 
to try to capture market. So the and that is what we call a kind of a cutthroat co competition. Prices are forced down to make one of the players sort of win this uh, this war, and it will sooner or later, if this is allowed to work without any interference, infer uh, interference by let's say the owners or whoever, that one of the players are left uh, with the victory and the others go bankrupt. Well, I'll elaborate a bit more on this uh, later on. But let's return to this two company case where um, you have this distribution of uh, customers along the line 0 to L and you have an initial location of A and B here. These are the two companies that compete for the customers between 0 and L along this line. And if you think about this as a system where the relocation costs are very, very low. And if you are in A here, and the this is the transport costs, and they have equal production costs. If you are company A, you could think that, well, if I move to here, I will actually capture this part of the market, whereas B is left with only this part of the market. At the outset, they split the market equally be in between them. In the new situation, where A moves to this point, A captures quite a lot of the market. And B will, of course, not sit and watch this happen. So they, they can then ans reply to this or answer to this action by moving just to the left of A. If they do that, B will regain most of this market and A will be the loser left with this small fraction of the market. And this goes on, and this is not, you can imagine that it could happen if the relocation costs are zero. But the, the point is that they will end up in the middle point. Sharing the market equally between them, no, none, no action, no relocation, can then make any of these two players better off. If they try to move away from this position, they will lose. But if they try to move away when they are initially located in, in the, these two positions, they can gain by, by, by shifting but they will end up here, in the middle. So, this is what happens, uh, and we can see this. I will come back to a couple of, uh, of uh, let's say, real life examples of this behavior. But you can think, a bit about, for instance, um, or could you imagine an example of this behavior when you end up in the middle serving a more or less equal share of the market in real life? TV programs. I'm not talking then about transportation, 
but about trying to capture market shares. In Norway, we had a monopoly within the broca broadcasting system. It lasted up to, I think it was around 1985 or something, or perhaps even a bit later. Then they got number two on board. And they started, the, 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 oh the incumbent, the national broadcaster, they had their news at, uh, at 1930, I think it was, at the time, in the evening. And then the, the, in the new entrant, they had their main news at nine. It's a nice distribution. Then you can have the news at 19.30 or, or at 19, 19.30 and the other one at nine. But then this started to, this gaming started. And they still have news at, uh, I think one has a 19 and the other one has a 21. But there are now sendings in between. And the first move that the new entrant did was to program their news half an hour before the national broadcaster. So they moved from here to here, and they captured the market, quite a lot of the market, because they, I mean, who wants to look at the news at, let's say, 1930, if there has been news broadcasted at 19? Perhaps some, but I think much fewer will, will watch the news at 1930 if another one has started let's say, fairly good uh, programs transmitting news half an hour before. And that, was, that is what happened. So the gaming started. And, uh, and now it's, uh, it's again back to a fairly distributed system. But they have tried to, let's say, make a differentiated approach towards news broadcasting so they can again deviate a bit from each other in terms of having a different profile on their programs. This situation is about a homogeneous good like ice cream on the beach. The beach, the sellers, they had small carts so they can relocate without any costs located in the uh, and they ended up in the middle uh, as long as you can have a different mix of products you could still have a situation where you can relocate or have a location a bit a bit distant But just to finish this before we break, uh, if you have this location in the middle, like this, instead of location A, B, both A and B will split the market 50-50. Location of both in X will split the market 50-50. Um, <coughs> but the costs for those who are located in the central areas here, in the middle of this market, they will gain because the costs here as compared to the initial location, the costs in this area between here and here, are reduced. So those who have, those who are located in the middle of this market, mainstream consumers, they gain. Whereas those a bit more in the outskirts, 
of this uh, this 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 OL market, they get higher costs with this from this central location as compared to the more distributed location where the costs are lower. So there are a kind of even if the market is dis distributed equally between the companies, the consumers faces losses at the outskirts, but the main, the main uh, let's say the, the, the people who are located uh, in the central areas, they gain. Yeah, I will uh, continue after uh, the break with some examples which may perhaps make it a bit easier to understand the intuition behind this spatial competition. So we break down until 20 past. <laughs>